in undertaking any study of the Dune series from a thematic point of view, it is best to commence with one of the themes that for want of a better term, permeates the entire series. This is primarily for the reason that while some of the dominant themes perpetuate throughout the series, others peter out to a certain extent, and while not ignored altogether, lose a sense of their prominence as the narrative continues. This is not hard to comprehend when we look at the enormity of the Dune series, both in terms of its actual length, and the sheer epic scale of the story, which takes place over several thousand years. In saying that evolution as a theme permeates the Dune series, I mean that it is a theme strong at both the beginning and the end of the series, and maintains within it the details of the other major focal points of the story. Some of the major themes do diminish as the narrative progresses, but Herbert ensures evolution remains a constant throughout the series. Evolution, including eugenics and genetic engineering, represent one of the most detailed and lengthy thematic explorations in the Dune series, and although tertiary to the other dominant themes, it is to a degree much more expansive in scope. As mentioned earlier, Frank Herbert's themes are complexly intertwined like the threads in an intricately woven tapestry, and are difficult to tease apart upon individual examination. Towards that understanding, it must be noted that the theme of evolution and genetic engineering does much to inform Herbert's approach to his superhuman protagonists, themselves products of evolution through either artificial selection based breeding programs, genetic engineering, or forced evolution by symbiotic mutation. In knowing this, then we can realise how evolution and genetic engineering as a theme shapes and helps realise the first of Herbert's two major themes in Dune, that of the catastrophic hero and the periodic messianic impulses that overtake society. Evolution and genetic engineering are also viewed as systems and tools of the long term expansion and survival of the human species. In his provision of the second of the Dune series major themes, that of ecology, evolution as a system for the development and survival of life is in turn influenced by the ecology of a given environment, and vice versa. Collectively, all three of these themes are seen most importantly by Herbert as systems utilised by human beings. The importance of understanding systemic thinking, especially in a long term scale, is crucial in realising how these themes interact and weave together in the narrative of the Dune series. Systemic thinking is similarly important to Herbert in presenting ecology as a subject for investigation, especially due to the differences he perceived between western man and tribal societies. Likewise it is crucial in understanding the socio-political trappings that develop around charismatic leadership. Herbert's examination of evolution and genetics fundamentally adds to his speculation on each of these complementing topics. As evolution and genetics are themes from subject matter in science and science fiction from the mid to late 19th century onwards, Herbert's discourse on these topics is in itself an evolutionary one that we are able to witness for ourselves as the millennia slip by within the narrative of the Dune universe. Frank Herbert's examination of evolution and genetics in the Dune series came from his desire to subvert the contemporary mode of science fiction as it was in its state of stagnancy during the 1950s and 1960s. Primarily, this desire was based on two approaches. Firstly, to turn the tide against the typical nature of science fiction heroes, especially the Van Vautian hero that had been recurring since the 40s. This hero was often a mutation of baseline humans, modelled on the concept of an evolved ubermensch. This was in its essence an individual protagonist who was usually set apart from the rest of humanity, often possessing unique powers and abilities granted to them because of their evolutionary differences. Characters from science fiction stories that featured supermen were a favourite of John W. Campbell, the editor of Amazing Stories and Analogue. On the premise that science fiction stories were the kind of stories that science fiction editors buy, many of the works featuring in these publications began to follow this trend. Secondly, as this trend was tied to the future evolution of man, and because science fiction seemed to becoming more a literature that was viewed as being in the gutter, Herbert wanted to write a work of some length that was more aspiring towards quality literature than pulp fiction. 
This was also in part to do with the fact that Herbert often had trouble writing shorter works, his stories often going over the prescribed word length for publication. In having evolution combined with the dangers of society's messianic impulses towards unusual and highly charismatic leaders, it was towards Victorian science fiction that he turned for his inspiration with these themes, and in particular to the works of Samuel Butler, and to a lesser extent, Edward Bulwer Lytton. Notably, it was this kind of fiction that Herbert favoured in his youth, before proudly declaring his intentions of being an author to his bemused family. Evolution has been a popular topic for consideration from the earliest forms of the genre, and can be found in many a work which existed prior to the great spur of the subject, namely, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, by Charles Darwin. Brian Stableford's entry on evolution in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, 2nd edition, sums up the relationship between science fiction and evolutionary theory quite elegantly when he states that, there is inevitably an intimate connection between the development of evolutionary philosophy and the history of science fiction. In a culture without an evolutionary philosophy, most of the kinds of fiction we categorise as science fiction could not develop. While there is an abundance of work within the genre exploring issues relating to evolution, Stableford is not so optimistic when discussing genetics within science fiction, if not self-promoting. Stableford's entry on genetic engineering in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction describes the genre's forays into the subject as showing little that is championing the cause of genetic engineering, although Stableford is to a degree correct here when he describes the Kwisatz Haderach breeding program of Dune as a pedestrian affair of long-range eugenics, he repeats the common mistake of only looking at the first part of Herbert's series. Dune may focus almost entirely on the results of the Bene Gesserit breeding program, but in ignoring the other books in the series, one fails to notice the many other concepts of genetic engineering and associated technologies as they evolve throughout the series. Genetic engineering is viewed as the language of God by the Bene Tleilax, and the nature of their own patriarchal society is crucial to the development of the story. It is just unfortunate that the only part of the series that they do not appear in is Dune itself. Stableford ends his article in the Encyclopedia by demonstrating that the potential for science fiction stories that focus on genetic engineering is far from being realised. It cannot be said that science fiction writers have as yet explored the real potential which genetic engineering technologies hold for the radical remaking of the human world, but a beginning of sorts is made by the speculative future history, The Third Millennium, by Brian Stapleford and David Langford, and by Stapleford's various spin-off short stories, some of which are collected in Sexual Chemistry, Tales of the Genetic Revolution. It is because of the verisimilitude that the themes of evolution and genetic engineering lend to the historical backdrop of the Dune universe that Frank Herbert's notions and concepts of this subject matter bolster and reinforce the other predominant themes in the Dune series. Herbert's approach to evolution, as we shall see, is not just presented to the reader as a singular path that humanity may take down its journey of development as a species, but rather as something altogether more chaotic and complex. This is often a trend in science fiction literature that tends to explore either a particularly single viewpoint, for example the Martians in The War of the Worlds, or occasionally for the benefit of contrast and comparison, a dual presentation of mankind's evolution, such as the Eloi and Morlocks in H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. The epic scale of the Dune series instead provides Herbert with the scope to explore many different avenues of evolution, while also giving him the room to show it as a process which systems, technology and human conventions continue to alter and adapt over a lengthy timescale. At the heart of the Dune universe, in its cultural, social, religious, technological and ultimately evolutionary spheres, is the event known as the Butlerian Jihad. The Butlerian Jihad functions in the same manner to Dune as J.R.R. Tolkien's History and Languages of Middle-earth do so with The Lord of the Rings. That is, it lends to the narrative a believable and well-realised historical background that in turn permeates effortlessly into the narrative of the story's present day. The Butlerian Jihad is a long war between humanity and thinking machines. 
One of the results of this holy war is the development of the commission of ecumenical translators, which simultaneously destroys some religions that are resistant to its edicts, whilst merging and integrating others that are more open and susceptible. This action places humanity in a downward atavistic spiral through its prohibition of intelligent machines, or artificial intelligence. The Butlerian Jihad creates a universe that exhibits many qualities of a feudal society where people fear what machines may become. As the Butlerian Jihad retards the development and ultimately evolution of thinking machines, it serves to spur human evolution down differing paths. Many of the ideas presented through the Butlerian Jihad show Herbert understanding and referencing quite deliberately more traditional and earlier works of science fiction, and especially the ideas of Samuel Butler, the Victorian iconoclast and novelist who first presented many of the notions that are extrapolated in Dune. Butler's fame was in part for his novels, especially the posthumously published The Way of All Flesh, but also as an iconoclast he amusingly snapped at the inadequacies of Victorian society. However, Butler is also well remembered for his very public if rather one-sided spat with Charles Darwin over his ideas on evolution and the origin of species, despite having been an earlier supporter of Darwin. Samuel Butler's Erewhon, published in 1872, is a pastoral utopia set in New Zealand and is paramount to understanding many of the underlying concepts and dominant themes in Dune. It is a novel of great significance, not just during the early years of its initial anonymous publication, but remains so today with the study of science fiction as a genre. Erewhon presents itself as a satire that looks into both Victorian values and the storm that brewed in that society in the following years after the publication of Darwin's On the Origin of Species in 1859. It is perhaps not only the first book to explore the concept of machine evolution in light of the theory of natural selection and all that it implied to Victorian society, but is also probably the first work to speculate on the nature of artificial intelligence and technological singularity. These are themes that have come to dominate science fiction in recent years, especially within the realms of cyberpunk and the recently re-emerged and reinvigorated space operas popularised by the likes of Ian M. Banks, Alistair Reynolds and Dan Simmons. The Butlerian Jihad represents a turning point in history for Herbert's Dune universe, and is the palette from which he was able to draw so many of his memorable characters and institutions. It underlies two of Herbert's key warnings in the novels, firstly that of a society that blindly follows leaders, and secondly the inherent dependencies that human beings develop, specifically centred on the reliance of machines and technology. Timothy O'Reilly, in his book Frank Herbert, suggests that the Butlerian Jihad comes from a direct result of the fear of computers in our own culture, based upon an article that Frank Herbert had written from the San Francisco Examiner in 1968. This premise is incorrect however, although the fear of machines progressing beyond human beings in an evolutionary advancement was the key idea presented in Butler's Erewhon. Herbert himself was interested in computers and used them in his work as a writer, at one point investing money into the development of a new computer system in 1979. The events of the Dune series begin in the year 10191 after Guild, approximately the year 24191 AD. The Butlerian Jihad itself commences in 201 BG, which is before the Guild, and finally ends in the year 108 BG. This period of history in the Dune universe is a crucible focused around the oppression of humanity by thinking machines, which spurs a revolt and ultimately a jihad to eliminate these machines completely. It is in the upheaval that is created in the aftermath of humanity's victory that causes a fundamental transformation to every single aspect of the human universe. Then came the Butlerian Jihad, two generations of chaos. The god of machine logic was overthrown among the masses and a new concept was raised. Man may not be replaced. We learn a great deal of the Butlerian Jihad from the second appendix of Dune, entitled The Religion of Dune. The purpose of this appendix is to highlight the dominant religious systems in the Imperium and illustrate if there is any similarity to the religion of Moadib when he sits upon the Golden Throne. 
Prior to the ascent of Paul Moadib Betrides on Arrakis, and his rise to the position of Emperor and Messiah of the Fremen, the religious beliefs of the Dune universe are shaped by a number of forces. Herbert tells us in the second appendix that these are as follows. 1. The Orange Catholic Bible produced at the Commission of Ecumenical Translators, the CET. 2. The Bene Gesserit. 3. The ruling classes of the Landsrad and the Guild, who are essentially agnostic in truth but use religion as a tool of statecraft. 4. The ancient teachings which include Buddhist-Islamic teachings, Hinduism, the Zen Sunni wanderers variants of Islam, a variety of Eastern faiths, and the Butlerian Jihad itself. 5. Space travel, possibly the most important of all. As a result of the Butlerian Jihad, Herbert tells us that two major developments took place within the religious spheres of the Empire. The first of these was the realisation that all religions had at least one common commandment, Thou shalt not disfigure the soul. The second of these developments was the commission of ecumenical translators. The purpose of the CET was essentially to examine the nature of all the faiths in the empire, and produce a common work of religious beliefs, and after seven years of work, they eventually produced what was to become the Orange Catholic Bible, known as the OC Bible. Although the result was the OC Bible, the goal was to remove a primary weapon from the hands of disputant religions, that weapon, the claim to possession of the one and only revelation. The attempt to create an all permeating universal religion caused huge upheaval and many deaths, but eventually the CET produced the OC Bible, which is described at one point as a work created by the Hubris of Reason. During these periods of transition, it is the Guild, the Landsrad, and the Bene Gesserit who help hold the fabric of society together. We occasionally learn of the religious attitudes developed by the CET through the Bene Gesserit, who often take great affront if they suspect certain aspects of the sacred commandments towards technological and mechanical prohibition are being violated. At the beginning of June, when Paul is first tested with the Gom Jabbar by the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohim, he asks her why she tests for humans, her reply being, to set you free. The purpose of this test is to create a crisis point, a gateway where one may either pass and survive, or fail and die. The very essence of this test is not just the survival of the fittest, but also to determine if the person is a human, and more specifically, not an animal. Although the Reverend Mother is testing Paul to see if he is the Kwisatz Haderach, in a moment of clarity, he asks her if the Kwisatz Haderach is a human Gom Jabbar. The crisis point of the Gom Jabbar is a frequent spur of evolutionary advancement in the Dune series, and is a key concept in reawakening the genetic memories of the Tleilaxu Golas, as we shall see later. Once men turned their thinking over to machines in the hope that this would set them free, but that only permitted other men with machines to enslave them. Thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a man's mind, Paul quoted. Right out of the Butlerian Jihad and the Orange Catholic Bible, she said, but what the OC Bible should have said is, Thou shalt not make a machine to counterfeit a human mind. Have you studied the Mentat in your service? I've studied with Thufir Howard. The Great Revolt took away a crutch, she said. It forced human minds to develop. Schools were started to train human talents. Bene Gesserit schools? She nodded. We have two chief survivors of those ancient schools, the Bene Gesserit and the Spacing Guild. The Guild, so we think, emphasises almost pure mathematics. Bene Gesserit performs another function. Politics, he said. Kulwahad, the old woman said. The Butlerian Jihad, as we have seen, creates fundamental changes in the Dune series that last for several thousand years, the consequences of which change society and the way human beings think in terms of their evolution and their place in the universe. The mental physical schools that developed out of the Great Revolt, such as the Bene Gesserit, politics, and the Spacing Guild, mathematics, are created to remove humanity's reliance on intelligent machinery and advanced technology. The doctrine that emerges from the CET 
serves to cease the divisions amongst human beings created by the vast range of religions in the Imperium, while simultaneously creating a common consensus regarding artificial intelligence and advanced technology, which equates such things with holy commandments and sin. The Butlerian Jihad's influence throughout the Imperium is paramount, and the consequences that it creates are obvious and far-reaching. The Butlerian Jihad itself represents not just an influence on Frank Herbert's most famous creation, but also created a platform for the author to extrapolate some very fascinating ideas from post-Darwinian science fiction, and in particular Samuel Butler's Erewhon. Both works are products of their times, and illustrate the fascination that science fiction has with the subject of evolution. As mentioned earlier, there is a prominent association between science fiction literature and the development of evolution as a theory. We are all familiar with the argument that continues to rage heatedly in today's society between those that believe evolution is an elegant and obvious theory that explains the complexities and continued development of life on this planet, and those who do not. The flip side of the argument follows that evolutionary theory allows no room for the creation of life on earth by a divine hand, and the resulting disagreement goes back to the time of Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin's theories of evolution by means of natural selection. Their two papers were presented to the Linnaean Society on the 1st of July 1858, and were jointly entitled On the Tendency of Species to Form Varieties, and on the Perpetuation of Varieties and Species by Natural Means of Selection, and later published in August of the same year. The theory of evolution by natural selection, as presented in Darwin's On the Origin of Species, which would see publication in the following year, albeit not in its finalised form, and his later work The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, would see the beginnings of a heated disagreement that would continue up to modern times. The main political arena for this debate is generally within the sphere of education, particularly in the United States of America, where the question of whether a religious creationist viewpoint should be taught, now very much in the mould of the intelligent design argument, or whether the theory of evolution should have primacy in the classroom. Just as it is today, Darwin's theories were quite controversial during his own times. The dominant viewpoint up until then was what we refer to as the fixity or immutability of species. This was combined with the concept that the Earth was only 5,000 years old, and that life on Earth was brought into existence by a divine creator. Prior to the publication of On the Origin of Species, science seemed to be able to prove the development of life on Earth very much on a par with religious viewpoints. Baron Georges Cuvier's essay on the theory of the Earth, published in 1827 for example, presents a treatise on the age of our world from an early 19th century perspective. It accounts for not only an approximate age of the planet, but also for the nature of the species which exist upon it. In reference to these ideas, this work comprises an attempt to examine both antediluvian myths and the post-deluge societies of the ancient world to come up with a plausible attempt at dating the planet. Cuvier's theory of a catastrophic deluge led to this belief in addition to explaining how the current existing fossil records produced examples of species no longer surviving on the planet. I agree, therefore, with Messrs. Deluc and Dolomieu in thinking that if anything in geology be established, it is that the surface of our globe has undergone a great and sudden revolution, the date of which cannot be referred to a much earlier period than five or six thousand years ago that this revolution overwhelmed and caused to disappear the countries which were previously inhabited by man, and the species of animals now best known. This however was not the only view, and discourses through the science of natural history were beginning to produce ideas that contradicted this. As much as evolutionary theory was not actually seen as a taboo subject when it was discussed in the early 19th century, no one had yet been able to provide a solid and convincing hypothesis that met with universal agreement. Early doubters of theories such as Cuvier's included the likes of Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles, who had himself been one of the early pioneers of evolutionary theory, in particular with his poetical works The Loves of the Plants, The Economy of Vegetation, and the more scientific work Zoonomia or The Laws of Organic Life, 
which was published in two volumes. The Botanic Garden is of particular interest not just for its ideas on evolution, but also for the fact that it can be considered a work of proto-science fiction, speculating as it does on concepts such as steam power, powered flight, and submarines. It was in Zoonomia that Erasmus Darwin put forward some of his more detailed notions on evolution that show the strength of his convictions in his ideas. From thus meditating on the great similarity of the structure of the warm-blooded animals, and at the same time of the great changes they undergo both before and after their nativity, and by considering in how minute a portion of time many of the changes of animals above described have been produced, would it be too bold to imagine that in the great length of time since the earth began to exist, perhaps millions of ages before the commencement of the history of mankind, would it be too bold to imagine that all warm-blooded animals have arisen from one living filament, which the great first cause endued with animality, with the power of acquiring new parts, attended with new propensities, directed by irritations, sensations, volitions and associations, and thus possessing the faculty of continuing to improve by its own inherent activity, and of delivering down those improvements by generation to its posterity, world without end? Jean-Baptiste Lamarck was another naturalist who put forth some of the more convincing arguments about evolution, and would in turn actually become the proponent of the main theory which would compete against Darwin's. Lamarck's ideas on evolution were primarily presented in his work, Philosophie Zoologique, published in 1809, and it does represent the first properly assembled and coherent theory of evolution that went against the received ideas of the time. Lamarck's ideas were focused on two key principles which suggested that evolution of animal life was spurred by two natural forces or mechanisms. The first of these was that animal life was driven forward by a mechanism that meant that animals evolved from simpler forms to more complex examples of life. However, the problem with the origins of these species, according to Lamarck's ideas, was that simplistic animal species were produced by spontaneous creation, a process which continued throughout time to create new species. The second of these principles was that there was a mechanism which allowed animals to adapt to their given specific environments. Depending on the nature of the environment, certain species would develop or lose characteristics which could then be passed on to their offspring. This idea was known as the theory of acquired characteristics, though today it is also referred to as soft inheritance or Lamarckism. Charles Darwin would however fully reject this theory, seeing it as not being the result of any given natural law. Charles Darwin and his theory of natural selection came to prominence after the publication of arguably his most famous work, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, and the subsequent the descent of man and selection in relation to sex. With the prominence to which Darwin's theories of evolution and natural selection arose, the validity of concepts such as immutability and soft inheritance as part of evolutionary theory were fast becoming moot, although as long as Darwin had his detractors, these older viewpoints would continue to have their supporters. Darwin himself acknowledged Lamarck's contribution to evolutionary theory, noting that Lamarck was the first man whose conclusions on this subject excited much attention, describing him as a justly celebrated naturalist. Darwin's work fundamentally changed how human beings view their place in the natural world, and in doing so, called into question so many ideas and preconceptions that mankind held upon its existence. As we have seen with Erasmus Darwin's work, Science fiction had an early interest in evolution, and in the time following on the origin of species, it would only be within a very short number of years that it would become apparent how important a subject it would become to the genre. Notable examples of this are easily found in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and probably none more famous than three of H.G. Wells's works, The Time Machine, The War of the Worlds, and The Island of Dr. Moreau. The Time Machine depicts the development of two divergent human species, the Eloi and the Morlocks, in the far future of humanity and show mankind's evolution directed by social Darwinism. The War of the Worlds again is suggestive of human evolution through the Martians, 
who represent how humanity will evolve perhaps in a million years' time. The island of Dr Moreau, as much as a response to the debate over vivisection in Wells's time, shows a curious prediction of gene splicing and genetic engineering. Olaf Stapleton's Last and First Men and Star Maker are notable both for their vast timescales, which dwarf even those of science fiction novels such as Dune. Last and First Men explores the theorised evolutions of humanity, some 18 in all, through eons of time until their eventual extinction. Star Maker is even greater in scope essentially, being a complete future history of the universe, and explores numerous evolutions of beings and civilizations up until an omega point, where the universal collective consciousness comes into contact with its creator. Many other science fiction works continue to produce thoughtful and speculative viewpoints on evolution up until today, where the question seems to focus more on the post-human and extropian philosophies that are being extolled in the scientific and philosophical communities in regard to current thinking in medical science. Science fiction has also speculated on natural selection from the post-apocalyptic scenarios that the genre often presents in the post-World War II period. Works such as John Wyndham's The Day of the Triffids, Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End, Walter M. Miller Jr.'s A Canticle for Leibowitz, and P. D. James's The Children of Men, all present quite varied and differing looks at issues arriving from evolutionary change, natural selection, and the struggle of humanity to survive in new and difficult, often post-apocalyptic, environments. In consideration of the Dune series, I believe that there are two works from the Victorian era of science fiction which are of critical importance to Frank Herbert's opus. As excellent examples of pre-Golden Age science fiction, it must be noted that they do not merely act as an influence upon Herbert's work, a mere nod to a time that he would have viewed was producing original and quality science fiction. They represent strong ideological platforms that Frank Herbert would extrapolate heavily from, and used to create an enormous cultural and historical framework for the Dune series. As I have mentioned earlier, they are Samuel Butler's Erewhon, and to a lesser extent Edward bulwer lytons The Coming Race. The Coming Race is a novel which was published anonymously at first, and presented an examination of an advanced underground civilization known as the vril -Ya, who wait the day when they will arise and remove humanity from their place as the dominant species in the world above ground. The author's intention centred on the curiosity of Victorian society over the differences between Darwinism and Lamarckism, especially the Darwinian proposition that a coming race is destined to supplant our races. The vril -Ya are in fact evolved from tadpoles, and the anonymous narrator is credulous of this lineage as presented to him by Alf Lin, one of the vril and is no doubt similar to the incredulity experienced by Victorians in light of the implications of Darwin's theories presented in On the Origin of Species and the Descent of Man. Among the pithy sayings which, according to tradition, the philosopher bequeathed to posterity in rhythmical form and sententious brevity, this is notably recorded. Humble yourselves, my descendants, the father of your race was a twat. Exalt yourselves, my descendants, for it was the same divine thought which created your father that develops itself in exalting you. I presume that none of your race, even in the less enlightened ages, ever believed that the great grandson of a frog became a sententious philosopher, or that any section, I will not say of the lofty Vrilya, but of the meanest varieties of the human race, had its origin in a tadpole. At the same time as presenting us with an instance of similarity to the conflict of common descent between man and apes created by Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, bulwer lytton also describes the development of a visible nerve on the hands of the Vrilya, which is very much in the mode of the Lamarckian hypothesis of evolution, that is, the theory of acquired characteristics or soft inheritance. The Vrilya have been consciously able to alter their evolution over a period of time to facilitate their use of Vril, the wondrous fluid that is the source of all their power. This adaptation exists in the form of a nerve developed on their hands, which ultimately allows them to facilitate the staffs that they use and serve as conduits for the liquid energy. More remarkable than all this is a visible nerve 
perceptible under the skin, which starts from the wrist, skirting the ball of the thumb, and branching fork-like at the roots of the fore and middle fingers. With your slight formation of thumb, said the philosophical young Guy, and with the absence of the nerve which you find more or less developed in the hands of our race, you can never achieve other than imperfect and feeble power over the agency of Vril. But so far as the nerve is concerned, that is not found in the hands of our earliest progenitors, nor in those of the ruder tribes without the pale of the Vril Ya. It has been slowly developed in the course of generations, commencing in the early achievements, and increasing with the continuous exercise of the Vril power. Therefore, in the course of one or two thousand years, such a nerve may possibly be engendered in those higher beings of your race, who devote themselves to that paramount science through which is attained command over all the subtler forces of nature, permeated by Vril. Bulwer Lighton's The Coming Race is of particular interest here, as it provides an interesting comparison to Butler's Erewhon. Both works were published anonymously at first, and their similarity in subject matter, if not style, caused a degree of speculation on the authorship of Erewhon. Many people speculated that Erewhon had in fact also been written by Bulwer Lighton, whose identity as the author of The Coming Race was not a particularly well kept secret. Whereas Butler's work is presented in the tradition of a utopian satire, often remarked upon as being very much a successor to Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, Bulwer Lighton's is more in the mode of the subterranean adventure, serious in tone, and sharing more similarities to the works of Jules Verne for example. It was Butler who would become one of Charles Darwin's fiercest critics, ultimately rejecting bitterly his ideas of natural selection which he was at first in favour of, and later defending the work of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Bulwer Lighton's relationship to Dune is not of any major particular significance, with the exception of the similarities between the ubiquitous drugs of Vril and Melange. However, in reading Erewhon or The Coming Race, one inevitably, given any real effort at research or interest, comes across the other work. Their similarities are important, as is the fact that both books were associated with each writer having been published initially as anonymous works. Few drugs in science fiction share such given and varied qualities as Vril and Melange, yet it is of a significance which I do not wish to overstate that both drugs are tied to aspects of evolution. Samuel Butler, also later known as Erewhon Butler, was born in 1835 at Langer Rectory in Nottinghamshire and died in 1902. He was the son of a clergyman, the Reverend Thomas Butler, and received an education at St John's College, Cambridge, where initially having desired to study mathematics, he eventually achieved a first class degree in classics. The initial intent of his family, whom Butler had a reasonably antagonistic relationship with, was to have him ordained in the Anglican clergy as almost a part of a family tradition. His grandfather, Dr Samuel Butler, also having served the Anglican Church as Bishop of Lichfield. Butler however did not wish to enter the clergy, oddly enough like his father who had been pressed into religious service despite his wishes for a career in the navy. Butler did however have an intense dislike for religion in general, particularly due to his strict upbringing, and after questioning his faith and quarrelling with his father over his concerns via correspondence, he decided to leave England prior to his ordination and set forth to New Zealand in 1859. In New Zealand, Butler purchased some land overlooking the Rangitata River on the Canterbury Plains, and became a sheep farmer for the next few years, naming his land Mesopotamia. It was during his time in New Zealand that Butler first read Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. Initially, Butler read the work thoroughly, developing a great interest and respect for Charles Darwin's ideas. This was the beginning of Butler's quite serious interest in evolutionary thought, and became one of Darwin's greatest advocates at the time. Butler even wrote a dialogue and sent it to the Christchurch Press in 1862, garnering a reply from a certain Dr Abraham, the Bishop of Wellington. What is of note here is that as Philip Henderson points out, the Bishop indicates that Darwin's work had in fact been anticipated by a number of writers, Darwin's own grandfather Erasmus being amongst them. Notably, this would become a key point in Butler's later attacks on Charles Darwin, and would change his viewpoint on natural selection towards a more Lamarckian attitude. Darwin himself had even written to the Christchurch press 
complimenting Butler on his theories, but of particular note was Butler's correspondence to the press in 1863 entitled Darwin Among the Machines. This would later form a major part of the three chapters in Erewhon collectively known as the Book of the Machines. The article was not written under Butler's name, but was rather signed by a certain Kilarius, a nom de plume that Butler had used in his articles for the Eagle magazine during his Cambridge days. The key idea here was to present a humorous approach to defending Darwin's ideas by illustrating the evolution of machinery since the days of the Industrial Revolution. Erewhon, or Over the Range, has been described by P. N. Furbank as the most self-sufficient of Butler's books, and to my mind the most completely satisfactory one, and is together with The Way of All Flesh his greatest literary achievement. Erewhon is a gentle satire that subtly attacks elements of Victorian society at the time, more so than the posthumously published The Way of All Flesh, which was a biting attack on the values of family life during that era. Erewhon was written in the mode of a pastoral satire. Although often presented as a utopia, the society which Butler presents us is a topsy-turvy land that inverts many of the world's realities in order to highlight the hypocrisy of the times. In the land of Erewhon, for example, illness is illegal and considered to be highly criminal and immoral. At the same time, criminality is seen as an illness, a terrible suffering bestowed on an unfortunate individual, and something which would require the services of a straightener to prevent from happening again. Erewhon is in the tradition of the strange new land discovered through the journey of an individual who provides commentary on the variations of society from the viewpoint of an outsider. This was common in the literature of its kind, and popularised greatly by the likes of Jules Verne, although as Carl Friedman points out, it was a technique quite despised by other writers such as H.G. Wells. The country of Erewhon is discovered by Higgs. During his voyage of discovery through parts of New Zealand, either similar or identical to areas known to Butler during his time living on the South Island, he eventually crosses over the range to discover quite by accident this strange land. Erewhon was not just a work that asked curious questions of Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection. In doing so, Butler was applying what he knew of Darwin's theory to the expansion of machine technology since the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. This was, however, one aspect of Erewhon, and makes up a small but significant portion of the novel. Butler felt, however, that the work was more a gentler kind of attack on Victorian morality rather than any kind of major criticism against Charles Darwin. What is important in Erewhon is that the seeds of Butler's future argument against Darwinian evolution were being sown. In looking at the evolution of machines by natural selection, he realised that in gaining an understanding of evolution as presented by Darwin, mankind had been left with a mechanistic view of the universe, something that would seem to be painful for Butler to accept. His later works, Life and Habit, Evolution Old and New, Unconscious Memory, and luck or cunning would solidly attack Darwin's theory and its consequences, in turn creating uproar and notoriety for Butler. This in light of his previous work was somewhat mystifying for Butler, as he mentions in his notebooks. I attacked the foundations of morality in era one, and nobody cared two straws. I tore open the wounds of my redeemer as he hung upon the cross in the fair haven, and people rather liked it. But when I attacked Mr. Darwin, they were up in arms in a moment. Samuel Butler, despite having been a supporter of Darwin's ideas on natural selection, eventually reeled against them because they gave him little solace as to the point of human existence. Feeling as he did that natural selection provided such a bleak, mechanical, and desolate landscape for human beings to inhabit, then Darwin's theory allowed no room for the passing on of human knowledge and achievement. His return to the ideas of inheritance as provided for in evolution by Lamarck was seemingly essential to his mental well-being, and the notion developed in Erewhon and subsequent works of the direct passing on of traits from parents to children. Cole sums up his viewpoint of Darwin and the consequences of natural selection concisely. He saw Darwin as the destroyer of the foundations of human liberty, as well as the recognition of any element of purpose in human life and he sought to give man back his liberty, by insisting that the individual could not only learn by his own effort to master his environment better, 
but could also transmit this learning through a process of heritable biological adoption. The notion of the man who raged against the nature of family life in the way of all flesh turning to the family unit as his defence of his beliefs about evolution is an irony that is likely lost on few who knew Butler or his work. As Cole notes, Butler regarded the family as the great transmitting agency of acquired habits. Butler would come to explain his own viewpoint of inheritance from a familial aspect but did not elaborate in any great fashion. As Butler saw it, there had to be a direct continuation of memory between parents and their offspring. As C. E. M. Joad illustrates, it was George Bernard Shaw who was able to clarify and express Butler's position on the questions of development and inheritance in the evolutionary process. We are now in a position to enumerate the four main heads of Butler's position. They are 1. The oneness of personality between parents and offspring. 2. Memory on the part of the offspring of what it did in the person of its forefathers. 3. The latency of this memory until it is rekindled by a recurrence of associated ideas. 4. The unconsciousness with which habitual actions come to be performed. Samuel Butler's prolonged and public argument went to the core of the disagreements over the theories of evolution presented by various parties in the 19th century. Butler was deliberately iconoclastic and seemed to relish in the attention his attacks on Darwin produced. Charles Darwin tended not to respond to Butler out of, interestingly enough, a fear of the author's vehemence. Ultimately, Samuel Butler provided a notable attack on the tenets of natural selection from the point of view of an interested amateur arguing from a philosophical and intellectual regard that had no grounding in a methodological scientific approach whatsoever. His role in poking out logical problems of Darwin's theory centred on elements of natural selection that can be found in the works of Buffon, Lamarck and Erasmus Darwin himself. From Butler's viewpoint, this was a travesty that served to wipe these men's works from the historical record. Butler's other major problem came from the fact that Darwin had not provided a satisfactory answer to the question his work on natural selection offered up from its very title. What exactly is the origin of species? Where is the genesis point, the very beginning? Finally, Butler's other major problem with On the Origin of Species came from the mechanistic viewpoint of the universe that this and other evolutionary theses were creating. It seemingly brought Butler back to the desire of having a theistic outlook on the universe, which he had turned away from years earlier. The seeds of Butler's career of standing against Darwin's view of natural selection can all be found in Erewhon, many of which he would develop later in his evolutionary works. It would not be until the event of Gregor Mendel's work on discontinuous inheritance, which was subsequently rediscovered by the likes of Carl Eric Korins and Hugo de Vries, that these scientists' work would see the beginnings of the science of genetics, which would ultimately put Butler's arguments finally to rest. Erewhon presents several key concepts which upon a closer examination are found to be highly important in the study of Frank Herbert's Dune series, either as direct extrapolations or as major influences. Individually, one may look at these influences on Frank Herbert as perhaps a respectful nod from one author to another, but collectively, and through Herbert's acknowledgement to Samuel Butler in naming his Butlerian Jihad after him, on second glance we realise there is a greater importance to these concepts. In total there are five key ideas developed and explored by Frank Herbert from Erewhon, and are as follows. 1. The unborn and their plaguing of the Erewhonians. 2. The existence of a collective unconscious or racial memory. 3. Prescience as an evolutionary trait developed through natural selection. 4. The evolution of machines to a level, singularity, where human beings are subjugated and no longer the dominant species. 5. To a lesser extent, messianism and the origin of religious systems. Note, this is more through this subject being explored by Samuel Butler in the sequel to Erewhon, Erewhon Revisited. The Unborn, Preborn, and the Collective Unconscious. The nature of the unborn in Erewhon is uncannily similar to that of the preborn in Dune. In Erewhon, in the chapters entitled Birth Formulae, The World of the Unborn, and What They Mean by It, 
The unborn are the children of the Erewhonians who live on unknown planets in what is described as a pre-existent state. The way the unborn come into the world in Butler's topsy-turvy country is by the constant plaguing of potential parents from their pre-existent state, giving them no peace either of mind or body until they have consented to take them under their protection, the result of which is being born as their child. Once ready to be born, they then take a potion which removes their memories and identities before committing a form of suicide which then brings them into the world. The inhabitants see their children in the light of their concocted myth of the pre-born as a terrible imposition, and it is as part of this tradition that they have what they call birth formula drawn up, a document signed on behalf of the child at birth. This document is presented at a solemn and melancholy occasion some days after the child's birth, and states that the child takes all responsibility for being born, as it had plagued the parents to come into this world from a state where it had previously been altogether happy and looked after. These chapters represent one of Butler's typical inversions, in this case of the happiness upon the occasion of a new birth, and illustrate effectively the discontentment and unhappiness in his own childhood, though again here his work is more touched with cynical humour than being an outright attack on his own family. That would come with the eventual posthumous publication of The Way of All Flesh, it is however meant to be a strong enough indictment on Victorian family values. The nature of pre-existence in Erewhon corresponds to Butler's ideas of a collective unconscious, which show the beginnings of his doubts regarding Darwin's theory of natural selection as occurring by chance. It is a concept that predates those ideas Jung put forward in relation to the archetypes of collective unconscious, an area of psychology that interested Frank Herbert in his studies and would account for one of Dune's other major themes, the catastrophic hero. In Dune, the preborn are those children exposed to the water of life while still in the womb of a Bene Gesserit as she goes through the spice agony to become a reverend mother. The water of life is a poison taken from the bile of the newborn worms of Arrakis, which the Bene Gesserit sisters must change at a molecular level upon drinking, with failure bringing death. This is known as the Spice Agony, and those that survive it become full reverend mothers, opening up the abilities of other memory to the Bene Gesserit who are then able to look into their genetic past through all the women in history who have come before them. The preborn are also known as abominations, for more often than not they go insane, inheriting the same abilities as a full reverend mother along with full consciousness while still in the womb. The insanity comes from the constant plaguing of the different personalities contained within the female other memory, who all struggle for prominence and attention. A fully trained reverend mother is able to control the myriad of personalities within her, but the preborn have little experience to save them, often losing their minds to either one dominant personality or else to the entire multitude. In the Dune series, this happens to Paul's sister Alia who is eventually driven insane before finally committing suicide in Children of Dune. Paul's twin children are also pre-born due to the vast amounts of melange their mother is forced to take during her pregnancy to counteract the effects of a contraceptive poison. They are however spared the madness which consumes their aunt, albeit both being under the same pressures that other memory brought, and which ultimately caused her insanity. Leto II in particular eventually allows the personality of Harum to come to the fore in order to help him control the multitude, but what makes him able to deal with this better than Alia is not made clear. It is perhaps the strength that he gains from his symbiosis with the sand trout that makes him the ultimate predator that allows him to survive this. The unborn in Erewhon are a primordial collective unconscious separated from the Erewhonians, and are fundamentally connected to their views of reproduction. It raises the question of the unborn being a kind of mass delusion, but the fact that they are from another world, and hence alien, does not bother the Erewhonians who are themselves the end product of the unborn's desire to enter the world of Erewhon. The unborn's plaguing of the Erewhonians as a multitude seeking to be born 
is an obvious comparison to the preborn of the Bene Gesserit gender oriented other memory in Herbert's Dune series. The multitude of personalities of the female line that the Bene Gesserit experience vie for attention and re emergence through contact with the host personality of the Reverend Mother. The Bene Gesserit only experienced this after having had the training and wisdom of many years before going through the test of drinking the poisonous water of life. A fully trained Reverend Mother who has passed this test, then has access to this multitude, and is capable of bringing forward either a single personality or a selection of the collective whole, known as simuflo, in order to access their memories and experiences. The race memory, or other memory, or collective unconscious that is accessed by the Bene Gesserit is gender specific, only providing access to the female ancestry of the human species. This then is the real purpose of the Kwisatz Haderach breeding program, to create a male Bene Gesserit who is capable of accessing the memories and experiences of the male ancestry of the human species. Problems unforeseen arise in accessing this racial memory in two key aspects. First of all, the Kwisatz Haderach is seemingly able to access all genetic memories and experiences following the ingestion and transmutation of the water of life. However in addition to accessing the pre-existing and subconsciously hidden racial memory, the additional side effect of near or total prescience is observed in such an individual. The second unforeseen problem arises when a Bene Gesserit takes the water of life whilst pregnant. This causes the fetus to enter the state known as preborn where the collective unconscious available to the Bene Gesserit immediately becomes accessible to the unborn child, bringing the fetus to full awareness in the womb. This happens to Alia, Paul's sister, when Jessica undergoes the ritual. The Bene Gesserit forbids this under normal circumstances, referring to such a child as an abomination. Such children are often feared because of their unnatural maturity and knowledge. In addition, the experience of having the multitude of other memory at such a young age often results in madness and death. Interestingly, and despite the differences in other memory available to the Bene Gesserit, female, and the Kwisatz Haderach, predominantly male, Herbert shows Alia's growing insanity due to the clamouring of the multitude within her conscious mind turning to a male aspect within other memory. This is of course her maternal grandfather, the villainous Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. This is not really explained by Frank Herbert in Dune Messiah or Children of Dune, but it could be suggestive that as part of the same generation of the Bene Gesserit breeding program, and having the same parents as Paul, that Alia is at least a potential Kwisatz Haderach, despite being female. Herbert viewed Alia together with Paul as a representation of the Janus aspect, one looking forward, one looking back, as well as a representation of the Jungian archetype of the syzygy. Here Herbert has Paul looking forward, into the future, using prescience, and is fully conscious of time and space, whereas Alia is the direct antithesis that looks backward through other memory. This slowly but eventually subverts her own personality, both consciously and subconsciously, to the point where the Baron is able to undertake action by controlling her body. Alia continues to expose herself to large doses of melange in order to increase her prescient abilities which are similar to Paul's but significantly inferior. This continued exposure to large doses of melange continues to exaggerate her ever increasing fragile state, leading her to rely on the personality of the Baron Harkonnen to not just help her control the multitude in her other memory, but also to help her in the real conscious world, giving her advice and guiding her actions in the intrigues of Moadib's court. Herbert having the Baron as the dominant personality in her mind is difficult to explain in the Dune series, as there should only be female personalities within Alia. The seemingly obvious explanation that Herbert leaves us to ponder is that the Baron Harkonnen is most likely a manifestation of Alia's growing insanity, and not a product of other memory after all. It also gives Frank Herbert an excuse to bring back an interesting character that he had killed off in Dune, having done something similar with Duncan Idaho, 
who also proved to be very popular in the first novel. Leto II and Ganema are also born preborn and have the similar multitudes within their memories. Again, both characters represent the archetype of the syzygy amongst others, see chapter 3. But Herbert does not really explore how Ganema is able to maintain her sanity. Instead, the focus of how this is managed centres on Leto II. Both of the twins are able to hide the fact that they are abominations, but this is through deceit on their part. They are seemingly able to exhibit a level of control over the multitude, but as Leto II goes through his slow transformation into the God Emperor, he reveals that he has chosen one dominant individual personality from within the multitude to suppress all the other voices clamouring for attention. This is the personality of Harum, the Egyptian pharaoh. The collective unconscious, as perceived by Samuel Butler, is different from the representations of Jungian archetypes and as indicated earlier, is largely to do with the author's attitudes to Darwinian evolutionary theory. Herbert successfully blends the two concepts, most notably in the character of Alia, whom he uses to explore the nature of a collective unconscious and racial memory. In addition, Alia is in herself a study of an individual in the messianic complex, and as such represents a number of archetypes of the Jungian collective unconscious at different parts of the first Dune trilogy. These include the Virgin, the Harlot, one half of the Syzygy, the Heroine, the Mother, the Child, and the Hierophant. Alia is not the only character used by Herbert to explore these concepts, with Paul, Jessica, Leto II, Ganema, and most of the Bene Gesserit characters exploring racial memory in some form or another. The Bene Tleilaks also explore this, but directly through genetic manipulation with the final incarnation of Duncan Idaho, perhaps representing the ultimate combination of these ideas, where his other memory becomes a personal one based on his various incarnations over thousands of years. The Nature of Time and Prescience Samuel Butler also notably comments on the nature of time in the chapter The World of the Unborn, and presents us with an interesting evolutionary quandary. In the back to front nature of the Erewhonians, we discover that they perceive time and life's place therein as moving backwards. Butler's narrator, Higgs, discovers the existence of a pre Erewhonian race of men that died out long before the present society came into place. He is shown a text on the mythology presented to him by one of the Professors of Unreason. Before discovering the Erewhonian attitude to the unborn, he comes across an entry on a previous race of man that existed according to their myths before the Erewhonians. The entry is as follows. Sometimes, again, they say that there was a race of men tried upon the earth once, who knew the future better than the past, but they died in a twelvemonth from the misery which their knowledge caused them. And if any were to be born too prescient now, he would be called out by natural selection before he had time to transmit so peace-destroying a faculty to his descendants. Similarly, prescience is very much a problem for those who possess it in the Dune series, from the guild steersmen and navigators who use a limited form of prescience to help navigate their ships through space, to the almost ubiquitous and stifling prescience that is experienced by Paul and his son Leto II. It is an inversion in itself that Frank Herbert presents the idea of prescience as an almost accidental side effect of the creation of a superhuman who is supposed to be able to see into the collective unconscious of the male genetic line's race memory. Those Atreides males that possess this ability in the Dune series also have the gift of prescience, with Leto II almost having complete prescience. The nature of their controlled evolution through artificial selection almost suggests that it is with the Kwisatz Sadarach that humanity has reached almost a Teilhardian Omega point. This is not actually the case as we discover in Heretics of Dune when the character of Miles Tegg an Atreides descendant and product of a renewed Bene Gesserit breeding program, evolves the nature of the Kwisatz Sadarach even further when undergoing torture. It is in fact because of the apparent apex of human evolution 
which creates the tyrant god Emperor Leto II, that factions within the worlds of the Imperium begin to advance forbidden technologies. This in turn creates machines that are capable of hiding from someone so powerful they can see every action anyone is going to take before it occurs to them. The end point of evolution, regardless of what path it takes in human development, is surely to ultimately create the equivalent of a living god, like the race of prescient men in Erewhon who die out with the sheer misery that their foreknowledge brings them, both Paul and Leto II learn very swiftly that complete prescience is indeed a curse, if not an evolutionary dead end, leaving them virtually no joy or surprise in life. The desire to escape this and become a normal man is the major motivating force behind Paul's abandonment of the Golden Path. The revelation of a Tleilaxu Kwisatz Haderach by Skytail in Dune Messiah is notably reminiscent of the prescient beings from Butler's pre erewhonian race of men. In discussion with his fellow conspirators, the Princess Irulan asks the face dancer how the Bene Tleilax overcame their Kwisatz Haderach. A creature who has spent his life creating one particular representation of his selfdom will die rather than become the antithesis of that representation, Skytail said. I do not understand, Edric ventured. He killed himself, the Reverend Mother growled. The Kwisatz Saderach has a dominating control over time and space, and we note one of the appellations applied to this term refers to someone who can be in many places at once. The use of prescience by both Paul and later Leto II, in combination with other memory, gives them a sense of the possibilities and probabilities of future history, together with an all-encompassing knowledge of the past. This has led some to comment that the character of Paul Atreides and his messianic prescience is a response to the character of Harry Seldon and his psychohistory in Isaac Asimov's original Foundation trilogy. In that sense, Leto II may also be viewed as a response to the character of the Mule from Foundation and Empire and Second Foundation. In Donald E. Palumbo's discussion of chaos theory in the Dune series, he notes that James Gunn suggests Herbert's Dune is a critique of the Foundation trilogy, and subsequently prelude to Foundation is a response to Dune, though this is from the perspective of an ecological and political viewpoint, which I shall discuss further in Chapter 4. Herbert did not acknowledge any direct response to Asimov's Foundation trilogy, although there are a number of interesting parallels and dichotomies. Asimov's Foundation trilogy owes many of its attributes to Edward Gibbon's The History and the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, as similarly does Herbert's Dune, though it can also seem to be influenced greatly by T. E. Lawrence's Seven Pillars of Wisdom, as well as Butler's Erewhon. Both series feature a number of similarities, from their huge expanse of empires, the use of introductory historical documents, and characters who work to alter the future of mankind. In the Foundation trilogy, the use of psychohistory by its inventor Harry Seldon and his fellow scientists is put into place to preserve humanity and its knowledge as its vast interstellar empire goes into a predicted long decline. Psychohistory then is a combination of statistics, mathematics, and historical observations used to make almost completely accurate future predictions. In Foundation, Asimov describes psychohistory as that branch of mathematics which deals with the reactions of human conglomerates to fixed social and economic stimuli. Within this definition, there are two provisions applied in order for psychohistory to work, namely, that the human conglomerate being dealt with is sufficiently large for valid statistical treatment, and that the human conglomerate be itself unaware of psychohistory analysis in order that its reaction be truly random. Herbert's Paul Atreides seeks to prevent a cataclysmic event through the use of his prescience, which offers up a number of future possibilities, many of which culminate in the destruction of humanity. It is only through one particular route into the future provided for by his prescience, called the Golden Path, that mankind is able to survive this universal apocalypse. From Paul's point of view, this is a hard thing indeed, for it is essentially a route that means crushing much of humanity 
to ensure that those who emerge from the tyranny of the Atreides Empire are strong enough to survive. This forms the basis of an imposed order of natural selection that goes beyond social Darwinism, and as such, Paul is unable to bring himself to complete the task, abandoning the Golden Path. It is only through Leto II, who abandons much of his humanity to become the God Emperor, that the Golden Path is taken up again. As Palumbo notes, Asimov's meta-series champions a chaos to order perspective in its desire to bring about the re-emergence of empire after a period of stagnation and rot. Frank Herbert's Dune series champions an order to chaos perspective in that the Atreides following the Golden Path must destabilise and scatter their own empire in order for humanity to survive the apocalyptic scenario their prescience predicts. Palumbo's insightful work establishes the use of reoccurring chaos theory motifs throughout the Dune series as an accompaniment to the development of Herbert's theme of ecology, in that dynamic systems produce feedback loops that either maintain the status quo or destabilise and change the pre-existing systems. The reversal of these feedbacks is seen by Palumbo inherently in the fact that Paul and Leto II embody positive or destabilising feedback. Comparing Paul to the mule, he notes the following. Like the mule, Paul is a mutation who shifted the old balance and amplified disorder. And so is Leto II, who Paul calls the ultimate feedback on which our species depends, and who enforces a rigid order expressly to provoke chaos. It is through this observation that we have the dichotomies presented between the two characters. Both mutants, Paul and Leto II are our dangerous heroes seeking to bring chaos out of order so that in turn they can save humanity. They will be hated and despised for it, but their intentions and motivations, ultimately difficult, are inevitably viewed by the reader with the benefit of hindsight as praiseworthy. This is ultimately a paradoxical viewpoint of these heroes when we consider Frank Herbert's attitude that such men are destructive to society. The mule however is a villain who rules by the aid of his mutation, an ability to mentally coerce anyone, and brings chaos to the desired effect of order, the goal of the prediction of psychohistory and Harry Seldon's foundation. Differences aside from these two great science fiction masterpieces, it is with interest that inherently within their similarities, the association with chaos theory as a fundamental part of the nature of human systems, whether they be historical, political, or ecological, is what sets them apart. Frank Herbert's Dune series is seen as importantly anticipating the development of chaos theory, especially in relation to ecological science. Donald E. Palumbo looks at various aspects of chaos motifs in the Dune series and the Foundation series, but especially so when examining Dune's themes of ecology and the destructive hero that incorporates Joseph Campbell's monomyth. As mutations, and the end results of millennia long breeding programs, the characters of Paul and Leto II can also be seen as feedback loops when viewed as part of evolution as a dynamic system. Hence the prescient mutations of Herbert's universe deal with the chaos of balancing the golden path. Additionally, Herbert, according to Palumbo, complements this with interlacing the architecture of the Dune series itself with recurring fractal patterns, something he also sees as part of Joseph Campbell's monomyth. In dealing with the chaos that the evolutionary advanced ability of prescience creates in the hands of Paul and Leto II, Herbert has taken another idea from Butler's Erewhon and developed it with great skill. Herbert, in showing us two characters who are able to deal with the curse that prescience brings, together with its terrible responsibility and stagnation, shows us an example of what is fundamental to science fiction literature, the what if, and does so by extrapolating this brief segment in Butler's Erewhon about the first race that inhabited his topsy-turvy world.